go ahead and, and get started. There, there'll likely be some other people coming in. Um, there usually is anywhere from five to 10 to 15 minutes um, after we start. So, but we'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, um, welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Stephen Payne. I'm the director of the Bronx County Historical Society and I have really been looking forward to tonight. Um, tonight is part of our offerings um, for New York State Abolition Commemoration Day, which was actually yesterday. Um, we had a full day of programming at Lincoln Hospital um, with the Bronx branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, I, I recognize some of the names of folks who were here tonight were there yesterday as well. So thanks for um, coming out to both events. Um, but wanted to offer a variety of things because it really is um, a momentous day that should be celebrated and, and more widely publicized. And it's a relatively recent holiday as far as the state's concerned, but it's obviously been celebrated in one way or another, um, not always on, on the date that it's celebrated now, but it's been celebrated since 1857. Um, which is uh, July 4th, 1887, is when slavery was officially abolished in New York State. Um, there were a few peculiar uh, uh, kind of uh, persistence of, of enslavement in a couple instances afterwards, but for the most part, 1887 um, was the date. So definitely something we're celebrating and also educating about. And one of the things about New York State history um, New York City history and, and Bronx history um, that is still something that uh, isn't really, uh, you know, spoken about as much as it should be, um, definitely isn't uh, kind of centered in a way when talking about um, New York State and New York City history. There's a history of enslavement um, and the history of the history of abolition in our state. Um, oftentimes, it's easy for, uh, uh, for folks in the northern states of the United States to assume that slavery didn't exist in our states, but of course it did. And at one point, um, New York City had the highest uh, population of enslaved individuals, uh, or at least the highest proportion of households that held enslaved individuals right behind Charleston, um, South Carolina. So definitely a central part of the history of New York City and New York State. And excited today, to not just talk about the history of enslavement, a lot of times um, folks tend to uh, focus only on all of the atrocities of slavery, which is absolutely true, and might sometimes uh, cover over agency and resistance of enslaved individuals themselves. So tonight's talk will focus on um, not just the history of enslavement, but also the agency and resistance of two enslaved individuals uh, who went back and forth between the Morris estate, which was um, the largest uh, a largest estate at one point in the area that we know um, as the Bronx today, and New Paltz. And to lead us on this uh, very uh, well-researched, um, incredible kind of micro history of the lives of two individuals, um, I'm very happy to welcome Eddie Moran from Historic Huguenot Street. Um, Eddie Moran currently serves as the tour and interpretation manager at Historic Huguenot Street and as a historical researcher for the Dr. Margaret Wade Lewis Center in New Paltz. He graduated with a BA in history from SUNY New Paltz in the spring of 2020. Um, and he began his work as a tour guide at Historic Huguenot Street in 2017, has overseen guided tours and interpretation full time at the institution since January of 2022. He's a lifelong resident of the New Paltz area. And we were just joking before, um, you know, here in the Bronx, anything uh, immediately north of the Bronx, it's upstate. So, you know, to us, to us, he's a lifelong resident of upstate, but we'll see, you know, I'll leave it up to Eddie whether or not he wants to uh, accept that uh, uh, accolade. And he's also a descendant of New Paltz, Huguenot and Dutch colonizers. Um, so, the way that tonight will work, um, Eddie will give his presentation first, and then if folks have questions or comments, um, things they'd like to know more about, um, we'll have a dedicated time for Q&A afterwards, probably about 20 minutes, uh, maybe 30 minutes, just depending on how things go. And if you have questions during the presentation, you can go ahead and 
add them to Q&A and we'll take the Q&A um, at the end, like I said. But if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to go ahead and add it into Q&A um, while Eddie's speaking. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Eddie um, and welcome again, everyone. Looking forward to tonight's presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Wonderful, and so you should be seeing my title slide. Um, and I'd first like to, well, I should say first, of course, that I'm very excited to be here tonight to share uh, a portion of this history with you. Um, and as Stephen mentioned, tonight's talk will center on Anthony and Susanna, an enslaved African man and woman who were brought to colonial New York in the late 1660s or early 1670s to work on the plantation of the Morris family in what we now call the Bronx. And so that said, much of this story will center on the Bronx, uh, specifically the estate of the Morris family, which then, as Stephen said, occupied much of the borough. But today it gives us the name of the neighborhood of Morrisania, which was really just a small corner of what was then the larger Morris family estate. However, despite the fact that much of the case centers on the Bronx, it was not the connections to the Bronx. But of course, you could probably tell from that introduction, rather the connections between Anthony and Susanna and the Hudson Valley or the upstate town of New Paltz, New York, uh, in Ulster County, which really drew me to this research. And so in late 1673, after previously having been brought to colonial New York by the Morris family, Anthony and Susanna were actually seized from the Morris estate by the colonial Dutch government. They were brought north into the Hudson Valley to what we would now call the city of Kingston, New York, and they were resold here to a French colonist named Louis Du Bois. And this is really what drew me to this case. Uh, Louis Du Bois was eventually, uh, after this case takes place, or really amidst this case, was one of the founders of the community we now call New Paltz. And so Anthony and Susanna then are the first enslaved Africans on record to have been purchased by a European founder of New Paltz, New York. Now, what is historic Huguenot Street where I work? Well, New Paltz, I'll give some background, uh, is a small town on the west side of the Hudson River in Ulster County. And we're about an hour and a half's journey north of New York City today. And so the oldest portion of the New Paltz community uh, which was founded in 1677 by Louis Du Bois and a number of French colonists. The oldest portion of this community is preserved today as historic Huguenot Street. Uh, you can see our logo there in the bottom left. Uh, and so we are a historic site and museum where we preserve seven 18th century stone houses. Uh, it's on historic Huguenot Street uh, where I work, of course, and where I'm currently sitting to give this presentation. And so in late 1673, as I said, future New Paltz founder, and actually also my distant grandfather, Louis Du Bois, purchased Anthony and Susanna from the Dutch sheriff in what is now Kingston, New York, after they had been previously seized from the Morris family by the Dutch government. However, despite the purchase of Anthony and Susanna by Du Bois, they never came to live here in New Paltz. Before New Paltz was founded, Anthony and Susanna chose to instead change their lot for themselves. They fled from Du Bois, early in 1674, they crossed the Hudson River, and with the help of native people, they actually returned to the plantation of the Morris family in the Bronx. And over the following six years, so from about 1674 to about 1680, a long and drawn out, a really bitter legal dispute emerged between Louis Du Bois and Colonel Louis Morris, a member of the Morris family, regarding Anthony and Susanna's ownership. And it's from these, this court case, from this dispute, that we gain most of the documents which reveal the details of Anthony and Susanna's story. And in this evening's talk, I will present an array of those 17th century documents to reveal Anthony and Susanna's story of agency and resistance, as well as reveal what their experience of human bondage may have been like. And so just to give uh, you know, a bit of a sense of what I hope to achieve, uh, in the process, I hope to highlight the connections of New Paltz and the Bronx to the wider Atlantic world of the 17th century. I hope to highlight the presence and impact of African peoples on New Paltz and the Bronx from their earliest origins. And I hope to really highlight the need for further research to continue to raise up the stories of enslaved Africans in New York's history.
And before I dive in, I would like to acknowledge that portions of this story have been known to us in New Paltz and the Bronx for decades, thanks to the important work of earlier scholars in the 1990s and early 2000s. However, it was really just elements of the story that were known. It's because those earlier scholars were really just doing general research on the history of the Bronx and New Paltz. And so Anthony and Susanna, enslavement as a whole, were not their specific focus. And so with many sources now available online, which were then only accessible by physically combing through archives, much more of this story can be revealed to us. And I'd like to talk first a bit about how we came to this story. Uh, I mentioned some background on historic Huguenot Street. It's in the fall of 2023, so not very long ago, that we at Historic Huguenot Street, we began discussions with the Dr. Margaret Wade Lewis Center for Black History and Culture. You can see their logo on the bottom left here. They're a relatively newly founded uh, Black History organization here in New Paltz. Our two organizations began talks with the Witness Stones Project, whose logo you can see in the top left, to collaborate in erecting physical memorials to those who were enslaved here in New Paltz and on Huguenot Street. Uh, we know as historians, as uh, you know, employees of our organizations that deal in the history of New Paltz, that each of the historic stone houses on Huguenot Street were home to enslaved African people. Uh, and while, of course, much of our educational programs center around this fact, we really were hoping to make it apparent to every guest on the street, from the moment they view one of the houses from the outside, that they were home to people of color, specifically to enslaved people. And so the Witness Stones Project is a nonprofit educational initiative whose mission is to restore the, his restore the history and honor the humanity of the enslaved individuals who helped build our communities. Their work involves researching and documenting the stories of formerly enslaved individuals, engaging with communities to promote dialogue and understanding, and erecting public installations that honor the lives and contributions of the enslaved. And so you can see an example on the right-hand side here of a witness stone marker erected in Norfolk, Connecticut. And this is the type of marker we hope to erect for Anthony and Susanna. And I say for Anthony and Susanna because, well, erecting witness stones for all those who are enslaved here in New Paltz is no small undertaking. Uh, Stephen just mentioned just how extensive enslavement was in a place like New York City, uh, at times more extensive per capita than almost any other city in the United States. In New Paltz, even though it's a small town, is no exception. By 1709, 33 years after New Paltz was founded, there were 21 enslaved people recorded in the community in a surviving tax record. By 1790, 81 years later, the first U.S. federal census recorded over 300 enslaved people in the New Paltz community. And so rather than set out to erect stones immediately for all those who were enslaved here, we decided instead to set out on a long-term collaborative project, which would begin by erecting witness stones for Anthony and Susanna as the first people enslaved in connection with New Paltz, and would continue with erecting more stones each year. Now, it's in this vein we set out to compile the documents we knew of related to Anthony and Susanna, but from the start, we hoped that we would uncover some new information. Of course, with more and more archival documents made accessible online each year through digitization efforts, also with a foundation of research by earlier scholars to build upon, like I mentioned, and this time setting out with a focus exclusively on Anthony and Susanna, we hope to not just compile the records we knew of, but uncover more of their story in the process. And I'm thankful to say not only we were right, um, but I'm thankful to say that I'm here to share some of those newer findings with you tonight. However, I'd like to emphasize, last thing before we dive in, that this work is still incomplete, that you're going to notice immediately and throughout the presentation, there is still much of the story of Anthony and Susanna that we don't know. And this research will continue long after this talk. And so, I'll start with just, well, some context. What do we know about Anthony and Susanna's early lives? Where does this story begin? And it really begins in the late 1660s, early 1670s, when Anthony and Susanna are brought to colonial New York by the Morris family. Unfortunately, we still know very little about Anthony and Susanna's early lives. The first thing we can say with confidence is that they were enslaved in Barbados in the 1660s by a member of the Louis a member of the Morris family, Colonel Lewis Morris. We know this from a later court document 
that arises out of the dispute between Louis Du Bois and Louis Morris over ownership of Anthony and Susanna. And you can see a page from those court records on the right hand side here. About where my cursor is, there's a line that says, Mr. Webley sworn saith that the Negroes in question were the proper estate of the defendant and brought into the country by him and never sold or disposed of by the said plaintiff. And this small statement given in a much, much later deposition is our best source of information on Anthony, Anthony and Susanna's early lives. Uh, the Mr. Webley referred to there was a business associate of the Morris family. And this is him swearing in court out of the dispute between Du Bois and Morris that Anthony and Susanna were brought from Barbados to colonial New York by Colonel Lewis Morris. And so who was this Colonel Lewis Morris? Well, some of you may find the name Lewis Morris familiar. The Colonel Lewis Morris of our story, and you're noticing probably I'm calling him Colonel, um, I'm distinguishing him by that title because he is really the least prominent of a line of men named Lewis Morris who all play prominent roles in New York and New Jersey's history. Um, the man on the left-hand side here is the nephew of the Colonel Lewis Morris of our story. This Lewis Morris um, became later Chief Justice of Colonial New York and a Colonial Governor of New Jersey. In the center is a portrait of Colonel Lewis Morris of our story's great, great nephew, or sorry, great nephew, one too many greats. Um, the one in the middle was a speaker of New York's General Assembly, the colonial governing body of New York. And on the right, we have Colonel Lewis Morris of our story's great, great nephew. And he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So unfortunately, we do not have a portrait of the Colonel Lewis, who is um, kind of prominent in our story. And I'll leave these three portraits of his descendants up. Uh, just as background, while well, I give some context on the Morris family. Colonel Lewis Morris of our story, uh, who was really kind of, you know, the patriarch, so to speak, the founder of the Morris family here in America, he was originally from Monmouthshire in Wales. Uh, he and his brother Richard had fought on the side of Parliament in the English Civil War, and after the English Civil War, they purchased estates on Barbados and relocated there in the 1650s. Both Lewis and his brother Richard became prominent enslavers involved in the production trade of rum and sugar, and they built extensive political connections throughout the English colonial Atlantic. Lewis supported Cromwellian England's expansion into Jamaica and St. Lucia in the 1650s and 1660s, and he became one of the most prominent Quakers in the Caribbean following his conversion in the same period. Now in 1664, as Lewis and his brother Richard are established in the Caribbean, New Netherland became the colony of New York following its seizure by the English. So the Dutch colony of New Netherland becomes the English colony of New York. And this really presented itself as an opportunity for the Morris brothers. Much like they had expanded their business empire into the West Indies after the English Civil War, the English acquisition of colonial New York presented itself as an opportunity for Lewis and Richard Morris to expand their business empire here into the New English colony. Richard relocated to New York by 1668, and he not only administered his own business activities here, he acted as an agent representing the business interests of his brother, Colonel Lewis. In 1668, Richard purchased land in what we now call the Bronx on his brother Lewis's behalf in the area that would later bear the family name Morrisania. And in 1670, Richard signed a contract with his brother, allowing him to reside on the estate. Richard continued to administer both brothers' businesses and expand their holdings in the colony over the next two years, from 1670 to 1672. And although it's not known precisely when Anthony and Susanna were relocated to New York by the Morris brothers, it's likely somewhere in this time frame after Colonel Lewis Morris's brother Richard has begun establishing the brothers' businesses here in the colony. It's likely in that point that Anthony and Susanna are brought here, possibly after their estate in the Bronx is purchased in 1670. Now, despite the fact that the brothers were expanding their business interests here into New York, uh, this process really came to an abrupt halt in 1672. 
when Richard, Colonel Lewis's brother, and his wife unexpectedly passed away within a few weeks of each other. And this was a problem for the Morris family, because as I said, Colonel Lewis's brother Richard, he's really just acting as an agent for the family's business empire here in New York. When he and his wife pass away, it leaves an infant son, the Lewis Morris on the left-hand side of the screen here, as well as their vast business empire, uh, you know, really unadministered. Uh, and so this presents a problem for Colonel Lewis. However, it's not an urgent problem. Uh, he, Colonel Lewis, still residing in Barbados at this, at this point, and he's alerted of the situation. He begins the process of settling his affairs in Barbados, relocating permanently to New York, but the situation is really pretty stable. As I said, he doesn't feel an urgent need to relocate here. And it's because the English government is still in control of this colony. And with an English government in control, well, that government was friendly to Colonel Lewis Morris being an English person. And thankfully, with the wide connections that the Morris family had, the colonial English government appointed friends of the family to administer their business interests here and to oversee the infant child uh, who was orphaned by the death of Richard. However, this kind of lack of urgency, this also changed drastically. In 1673, a year after Richard passes away, as Colonel Lewis is going through this process of slowly getting his affairs in order in Barbados and relocating here, the Dutch briefly retake what became an English colony. Uh, and so this is in the context of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, and it doesn't last long. The Dutch are only in control of New York again from 1673 to 1674, less than a full year. And although it doesn't play a really kind of large role in wider New York history, it's not a very impactful event, the second Dutch acquisition of the colony, it plays an incredibly central role in the story we'll tell tonight. You can imagine with a Dutch government now in control of this colony again, well, Colonel Lewis Morris, his title gives you some insight. He is a, not just ally, but he is aligned with the English military. He's an agent of English colonization. And so you can imagine him in this process of relocating to New York. To New York. Well, there are questions about his physical well-being upon relocating. Questions about whether he would be captured by the Dutch, whether his property would be captured by the Dutch. And with a new Dutch government in place, the friendly administrators who had been appointed by the English government to oversee the Morris family businesses, to oversee the orphaned Lewis Morris on the left-hand side here, well, those administrators lost their authority. And so at risk of capture by the Dutch, rather than relocating to his estate in the Bronx as planned, Colonel Lewis Morris was forced to stop at property he owned on the periphery of the colony, on what we would now call Oyster Bay in Long Island. From there, he parlays with the Dutch government for a period before being allowed to come into the colony to rectify the situation. And it's this moment in which our story of Anthony and Susanna will really take off. You have Colonel Lewis Morris parlaying with the Dutch government, trying to get safe passage into the colony to gain control of his business uh, affairs, to look out for his orphaned nephew, and the Dutch government that's here has other plans. So the document you see here was published by the Dutch and is dated September 20th, 1673. It's titled Proclamation Confiscating All Property in New Netherland Belonging to the Kings of France and England or Their Subjects. And it is preserved today in the New York State Archives. Thankfully for us, it is translated as well. So you can see the image of the original document on the left and a transcription and translation on the right-hand side here. And as you see in the highlighted portion of this document, the newly appointed Dutch governor named Anthony Kolbe and his council of war ordered the seizure of all land, belongings, and property owned by the King of England and his subjects. As Colonel Lewis Morris had not yet relocated to the colony, and was thus still technically a resident of Barbados, clearly aligned with the English, Sometime before November 1st, 1673, the Dutch, going off of the proclamation we just saw, seized the estate of the Morris family in the Bronx. 
So in the document shown here, in which the Dutch appoint their own agents to oversee the remaining estate of the Morris family and to oversee the orphaned nephew, Louis Morris, the Dutch also reference the seizure of Colonel Lewis Morris's estate in the highlighted portion. As further documents will show us, this seizure included Anthony and Susanna, human beings held in bondage by the family. So I'll just read this highlighted portion. It says, Colonel Lewis Morris, a resident of the island of Barbados in the Caribbees, whose estate by the proclamation dated the 20th of September last, is confiscated for the behoof of the government. So what happens to Anthony and Susanna after they're seized by the Dutch from the Morris family's estate? Well, the document shown here is dated November 16th, 1673, and it is housed today in the New York State Archives. It's a letter written by the Dutch provincial secretary, Nicholas Baird, to Isaac Grevery, the Dutch sheriff at Esopus, which is the general name for the region we would now call the area around the city of Kingston, New York, here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, so the Dutch sheriff in what we now call Kingston, New York. And the letter informs that Dutch sheriff, Grevery, that four enslaved Africans had been sent to him and were to be sold at public auction on behalf of the Dutch governor. Baird referred to the enslaved individuals as, quote, one Negro called Peter, one young Negro woman, and one man plus a woman, unquote. As later court records will indicate to us, the unnamed man and woman referred to by Baird are very likely Anthony and Susanna. And so most of the details about what happens to Anthony and Susanna after being sent to Kingston by the Dutch government with instructions for them to be sold, most of what we know of what happens to them in Kingston comes from later court documents arising out of the dispute between Louis Du Bois and Colonel Lewis Morris over ownership of Anthony and Susanna. Uh, later court documents, as I said, will reveal the details of this dispute. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the second Dutch acquisition of the colony lasted only months. And by the end of 1674, the English were again in control of colonial New York. By this point, Colonel Lewis Morris was able to safely relocate to New York, and sometime after his arrival in the Bronx, I mean, he must have been astounded, surprised, we can imagine what his reaction might have been like, when Anthony and Susanna, who were not on his plantation when he arrived, again, having been seized by the Dutch and sold in Kingston, well, Anthony and Susanna suddenly reappear on his plantation in the Bronx. And what these court documents are going to reveal to us is that they reappeared in the Bronx after having been purchased by Louis Du Bois and later fleeing from his plantation. As I mentioned, they cross the Hudson River and make the journey to the Bronx to return to the plantation of their earlier enslaver. And it's this decision by Anthony and Susanna to return to the estate of Louis Morris, their earlier enslaver, which sparks the legal dispute between Morris and Du Bois. So what you see here are the earliest records of that dispute. They are legal proceedings recorded in the papers of English colonial governor Edmund Andros and transcribed in the published New York Historical Manuscript series. And they provide us further insight into what the experiences of Anthony and Susanna were in Kingston. The first proceedings on the left-hand side are undated, but they're transcribed alongside papers from August and September 1675. They contain a complaint from Gabriel Minviel, who was acting as the attorney for Louis Du Bois, uh, as well as what you see on the right-hand side, a response from Minviel to a complaint from Morris. And so we'll take a, a moment now, we'll pause and ask ourselves, well, who is Louis Du Bois? Some of you may be asking yourselves that question. I shared some background on Colonel Louis Morris. Well, Louis Du Bois is described in contemporary records as a Walloon meaning a French speaker, at that time, a French-speaking Protestant, from what we would now call Belgium. He was originally from the region around the city of Lille, in the French-speaking region of Flanders, which is now in northern France, but was under Spanish control, along with much of modern-day Belgium in the first half of the 17th century. Du Bois and his family had relocated first in the 1650s to Germany, 
And later, by 1663, they relocated here to the Dutch colony of New Netherland, eventually settling in a small village in the Esopus region outside what we would now call the city of Kingston, New York. And so I'd like to read for you all the complaint from Louis, uh, sorry, from Louis Du Bois's attorney seen on the right here. And so it says, the said defendant saith that he believes it to be true as the complaint alleges that the two Negroes now in dispute were part of the estate of the complainant, being a Negro man named Anthony and a Negro woman named Susanna, and that they might be taken from the said complainant in the time of the late Dutch war. But the said Negroes were justly and honestly bought by the defendant, Louis Du Bois, at the Sopus, or Kingston, not clandestinely, but an open vendue by the authorized vendue master there, to whom he made payment to them according to condition, they being sent to him as he is informed by the then Governor Anthony Colba, or Secretary Nicholas Baird, the legality of whose seizure or adjudication of any part of the complainant's estate is not for the defendant to judge. I'm going to kind of switch over here to the left-hand side of the screen and read another portion from Louis Du Bois's complaint. Uh, it says, do, do, do. The said Negroes were by virtue of said sale and purchase, quietly enjoyed and possessed by the plaintiff until last spring, when upon what occasion he knows not, they absented themselves and run away from the said master's service. And straggling in the woods, and after crossing the river, whereby some Indians directed to Colonel Morris their quondam master's plantation, where it's supposed they yet still remain. And though the plaintiff, by Gabriel Minviel, his attorney, hath often demanded restitution of the said Negroes, yet the said Colonel Morris, the defendant, hath and still doth refuse to do, claiming right and interest in them. And so it's from this where we can get some insight into. Anthony and Susanna's experiences. As the document reveals, Louis Du Bois had purchased Anthony and Susanna from Isaac Grevery, the Dutch sheriff, in the Esopus region, or in Kingston, New York, in either late 1673 or 1674, after they had been seized from the Morris family's estate and sent by the Dutch government to the Hudson Valley to be sold. Minviel stated that Anthony and Susanna were unjustly in Morris's possession at the time of this complaint's filing, and he asked that they be returned to Du Bois. According to Minviel, Du Bois had lawfully purchased Anthony and Susanna at a public auction in either 1673 or 1674 during the brief Dutch reestablishment of New Netherland. Anthony and Susanna remained with Du Bois until, as they say, the last spring, perhaps meaning spring of 1675 at which point they fled. According to this account, they crossed the Hudson River, they were assisted by native people, and they found their way back to the Morris family's lands in the Bronx. While Minviel had previously demanded restitution on behalf of Du Bois, Morris refused to abide by the request, maintaining his rightful ownership of the pair. Minviel thus asked that they be returned to Du Bois along with damages for the loss of enslaved labor during the most recent harvest. Now, the document on the right that I read a portion of, the complaint or the response from Minviel to a complaint of Lewis Morris. In this response, Minviel says that Du Bois, quote, believes it to be true that Anthony and Susanna were originally owned by Colonel Lewis Morris and had been seized from him amidst the 1673 reclamation of the colony by the Dutch. However, Minviel argued that they were then legally purchased by Du Bois at public auction and had been sent to the authorized officials there by either the Dutch provincial secretary, Nicholas Baird, or the then Dutch governor, Anthony Colba. Minviel declines to comment on the legality of Anthony and Susanna's seizure from Morris, and he instead asserts their rightful ownership by Du Bois. By his reckoning, Anthony and Susanna had been absent, absent from Du Bois for some 13 months by the time of these two complaints. Minviel thus asks that the judgment passed against the complaint in the mayor's court may be confirmed and the Negroes be delivered back to their master. And that was a quote. So there's some points of confusion here. Uh, I mean, in one sense, I'm showing you not just a complaint from Louis Du Bois. So a complaint from him being that Anthony and Susanna had fled from him and were now being held by Louis Morris. But 
The document on the right is a response by Louis Du Bois and his lawyer to a complaint of Lewis Morris. We have both of these documents, but we do not have the initial complaint of Lewis Morris. There's also a reference in these two documents to an earlier judgment in the mayor's court, and we do not have that earlier judgment either. So it's important to acknowledge, while these two documents do reveal an incredible amount of detail on what Anthony and Susanna's experiences were, we still are missing documents from this case. Now, I'd like to take a moment to consider the scale of the journey that Anthony and Susanna made, the scale of the journey revealed to us in those last two documents. As I said, Anthony and Susanna, after being purchased by Louis Du Bois, and you can see on this map here about where the village that Louis Du Bois was living was Hurley, outside of the city of Kingston, you can see where that is, they flee on foot, cross the Hudson, and are helped by native people making the journey back down to what we would now call the Bronx. And as you can see from this map, I mean, it's a journey of some 78 miles today. So many of you joining us uh, without seeing this map are likely familiar already with the journey from the Mid-Hudson Valley to New York City. Um, the prospect of making that journey on foot or by canoe in the face of violent consequences if recaptured is an incredible testament to the human desire to be free and to the exercise of agency by enslaved people in all settings. We may also wonder, well, why did they return to the property of their former enslaver? Why, after fleeing from Du Bois and Hurley, would they have chosen to make this long journey back to the property of a former enslaver? And while we don't know for certain why they did that, I believe separation from family or community is the most likely reason. As Anthony and Susanna are the first enslaved people to have been purchased by a future founder of the community of New Paltz, who was then living in a small village on the outskirts of the area we now call Kingston, I imagine their experience there would have been jarringly different from that in either Barbados or in what we would now call the Bronx. They may have had family connections to other enslaved people owned by the Morris family. Those connections may have even gone all the way back to their time in Barbados. Or, if not, they could have established connections with other enslaved people in an accessible vicinity to the Morris family's estate in the Bronx. Considering that many enslaved people are later listed in Lewis Morris's will and other documents of the family, and considering the vicinity of the Morris family's plantation, which was then New York City, I think it's safe to assume that at the very least, when Anthony and Susanna were seized by the Dutch and sold to Louis Du Bois, they would have been separated from the community they knew. I also wonder what their language could have played a role. Similar to, some of you may be familiar with, Sojourner Truth's experiences. Uh, she was an enslaved woman born here, in what we then called New Paltz. Now it's the next town over. Um, but she's born into enslavement in New Paltz in 1797. And Sojourner Truth uh, was actually sold from a Dutch-speaking enslaver to an English-speaking one and experienced mistreatment, uh, experienced physical repercussions for the fact that she could not understand the instructions given to her by her English-speaking enslaver. I mention this because Anthony and Susanna themselves were seized from an English-speaking enslaver, Colonel Lewis Morris, and were sold to a French and Dutch-speaking enslaver, Louis Du Bois, and what was then a majority Dutch-speaking community of Hurley. And so I think it's also worth mentioning that Lewis Morris says in the court records we have that he didn't know who Anthony and Susanna were when they appeared, and he detained them when they arrived at his plantation. Again, he's in the process of relocating here when they are seized by the Dutch, and most likely when he actually arrives to his plantation, Anthony and Susanna aren't there. Maybe he's filled in by someone else on the plantation of what happened to them. And so... Again, we can imagine his reaction when they suddenly, after self-emancipating, appear back on his plantation. They may have seen this period, the Dutch having reclaimed the colony, Lewis Morris struggling to relocate here to New York. They may have even seen this as an opportunity for them to resist. Um, perhaps they were planning to first return to their family or community in the Bronx before fleeing once again 
uh, maybe they were planning to return back to the need of people who had previously helped them. In the end, we just don't know. And I think this is one of the areas that bears further research as we continue to uh, look into this case. However, we do know how the dispute between Morris and Du Bois progressed, thanks to, as you can see here, further court records. The next documents related to Anthony and Susanna to have been located are from 1679, four years after the initial complaints we saw a couple slides ago. Now, much like those initial complaints, these later court records are also transcribed in the Andros papers, uh, which are published in the New York Historical Manuscript series. It's worth noting that in the period between these documents and the previous complaints of 1675, Louis Du Bois and 11 of his family members and associates had established the community that we now call New Paltz. So despite the fact Anthony and Susanna never lived here in New Paltz, they fled before the community was founded, much of this case, this dispute between Louis Du Bois and Colonel Louis Morris is occurring while Louis Du Bois is living right down the road from where I now sit on Huguenot Street in New Paltz. So these court records, which again are the next to survive, uh, they're titled on the left-hand side here, uh, they're titled a plea of Lewis Morris in the preceding case, and it's dated December 30th, 1679. The next documents are titled Arguments for Citing the Case of Major Kingsland as a Precedent for Lewis Morris. And this document is unfortunately undated. In Morris's plea, seen at the top of the screen here, he again asserts to the court that Anthony and Susanna, two human beings, were his legal property. And in the subsequent arguments for citing the case of Major Kingsland at the bottom, he provides a detailed argument regarding the proper application of precedent in the case. Now, I did not include an image of that full document here. Just to save time, I'm not going to dive into Morris's argument on how precedent should be applied, but I'll note that it was a in-depth and detailed legal argument. And it really centered on what was the central question of this case as determined by the court. Now that central question was whether Lewis Morris or Louis Du Bois were the rightful owners of Anthony and Susanna. And of course, what determined that? Well, what determined that, what became the central question was, was it legal for the Dutch government to have seized Anthony and Susanna from the Morris family plantation in the first place? And so the document in the center here is titled Judgment of the Mayor's Court in the case of Louis Du Bois versus Colonel Lewis Morris. This recorded judgment contains the notable declaration, which I referenced at the start of the presentation, by one of Morris's associates, Walter Webley, that Anthony and Susanna were brought into this country by him. Either Anthony and Susanna, either Anthony or Susanna, sorry, uh, actually appeared before the mayor's court for questioning at this point in 1679. The mayor's court also called Isaac Grevery, that Dutch sheriff in Kingston who had sold Anthony and Susanna to Louis de Bois for questioning. Now, although records of Anthony or Susanna's testimony have not yet been located, we do know that based on their testimony, based on the testimony also of Isaac Grevery, the court found the sale to de Bois by the Dutch government to have been legal. In a special verdict, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here, the mayor's court ruled that their decision rested on whether it was legal for the Dutch to have seized Morris's property in the first place. And the court found that the confiscation was legal due to Morris's then residence in Barbados. And so Morris was directed to return Anthony and Susanna to Du Bois along with damages. And this is notable. Uh, it's why I kind of made such a big deal about Colonel Lewis Morris being in the process of relocating to colonial New York and yet getting stopped in that process by the Dutch takeover of the colony. Uh, if he had relocated before his property was seized, well, probably at that point, much, much later, at this point, I should say, uh, the court would have found that that seizure was illegal if he was instead a resident of New York. But it's the fact that he had not yet relocated, he was still a legal resident of Barbados, that the court says the seizure was legal, and Louis Du Bois thus is the rightful owner of the pair.
Now, despite this ruling, we are quite certain that the court order never was fulfilled, that Anthony and Susanna never were returned to Du Bois. And thus, once again, they never came to live in New Paltz. And I'll talk about why we know that. This is again from further court records. So the ruling that Anthony and Susanna be returned to Du Bois was soon appealed by Colonel Lewis Morris. The next dated document from the case, which is seen on the left-hand side and continues in the center, and I'll zoom in just a tad bit so you can read the top, and I'll zoom down in a moment. Uh, this document is titled A Bill in Equity for Colonel Lewis Morris concerning the confiscation of his Negroes and their sale to Louis Du Bois by the Dutch government, and it's dated January 17th, 1679. Colonel Morris, in his appeal, asked the English governor, Edmund Andros, he asked him, as well as the assembled court of assises, which is what they called their court of appeals. So he asks the governor and the court of appeals to reverse that earlier decision of the mayor's court. In this appeal, Lewis Morris gives his own account of Anthony and Susanna's seizure. So I'm scrolling down just in case you're reading. Um, he gives his own account of their seizure and self-emancipation, and he references the prior verdict of the mayor's court, ordering that they be returned to Louis Du Bois along with damages. Now, it's notable that Morris references the specific precedent and logic used by the mayor's court in ruling for Du Bois. It's also notable that Morris claimed Anthony and Susanna returned to his plantation on August 13th, 1679. Later, he stated in the same document that, quote, about the month of January 1679, he was sued by Du Bois in the mayor's court. However, we already looked at those documents amid the Andros papers, not from 1679, but from 1675. And so once again here, we have discrepancies. Uh, the dates that Lewis Morris gives in the transcription you see on the left and in the center, they are not consistent with one another nor are these dates consistent with all of the preceding documents we've looked at so far in this presentation. And so it's possible that these contradictions stem from transcription errors in the New York Historical Manuscript series. Uh, it's possible that the earlier undated proceedings I referenced may have been incorrectly compiled amid other papers from 1675. In the end, unfortunately, we just don't know. Regardless, in these documents, Colonel Lewis Morris asks the Court of Appeals to reverse the earlier judgment of the mayor's court. And in the document you can see on the right-hand side here, which is dated January 18th, 1779-1780, Colonel Lewis Morris actually writes directly to Governor Edmund Andros to address his request for an appeal, not to the Court of Appeals and the governor as a whole, but directly on a personal basis to the governor. And before I reveal the outcome of the case, what happens after Lewis Morris appeals the case to the English governor and to this court of appeals? I'll first present some financial documents located in the archives of Ulster County, New York, which provide us insight on Louis Du Bois's intentions upon Anthony and Susanna's return. On August 11th, 1679, in the document transcribed on the right-hand side here, Sorry, left-hand side here. <laughs> um, Louis Du Bois and his father-in-law, Matthew Blanchon, appeared before the secretary of the government in Kingston, New York, and they reported the sale of Anthony and Susanna to Louis Du Bois's father-in-law, Matthew Blanchon, for 800 Dutch guilders. In this document on the left, uh, Louis Du Bois specifies that Anthony and Susanna remained in the possession of Colonel Lewis Morris, despite the earlier mayor's court ruling, and that his father-in-law, Matthew Blanchon, was obliged or was obligated to pay Du Bois, even if he were unable to gain possession of the pair due to, quote, accident or other cause. Du Bois likely proceeded with this sale under the impression that he had won out in the mayor's court. And so he was attempting to transfer ownership of two human beings for a profit before they were even again in his possession. And on this same day, 
Du Bois also reported the sale of an enslaved man named Mingo to a man named Thomas Harmonson and another man named Suvarian Tenhout for the sum of 1,000 guilders. You can see that document here in the center. Five days later, on August 16th, also in Kingston, Jacobus Elmendorf bought the rights to the purchase made by Harmonson and Tenhout. And so that's the document you can see on the right. And in doing so, he agreed to pay Du Bois the sum of 1,000 guilders for Mingo. Now, what's fascinating about this, why I bring up the center and the right documents, are because in the document on the right, the author actually first wrote Anthony before crossing out the name Anthony and instead writing Mingo in the margins. And so these documents demonstrate the extensive involvement of New Paltz's first European residents in the trade of enslaved Africans in the years immediately following their establishment of the New Paltz community. On the next slide, you'll see images of these original documents. And although we don't know why they first wrote Anthony in this document on the right, I'll zoom in so you can see his name written there. Again, his name is written here where my cursor is, and they crossed that name Anthony out instead of writing Mingo on the left. Maybe because Anthony and Susanna were never successfully returned to Du Bois. Uh, maybe he sells them instead to his father-in-law, and again, specifies that his father-in-law will owe the compensation, whether or not they are actually returned to them, maybe because they're unsure if the pair are actually going to be returned from the Morris family estate. At the end, unfortunately, we just don't know. And so the final outcome of the court case is revealed to us in these final documents, also transcribed in the Andros papers, as well as transcribed in the compiled papers of the Court of Appeals, which are also transcribed in the New York Colonial Manuscripts series. The governor and council and the documents you see here, uh, specifically the document on the left, the governor and council ordered that the, quote, grant for an appeal be presently suspended, unquote, they ordered that copies of all proceedings be provided to the council secretary and that the, quote, parties and Negroes appear before them on Saturday come Senate in the fort before noon. So on October 6th, 1680, as you can see on the top right here, Min Viel, Louis Du Bois's lawyer, and Colonel Lewis Morris are listed in the docket for the Court of Appeals. And we can assume, based on the court order on the left, that Anthony or Susanna, if not both, had also appeared in court on this day, as was ordered by the English governor. Fortunately, the verdict of the Court of Appeals is transcribed in the New York Historical Manuscript series. After reviewing the earlier proceedings and hearing from each of the parties involved in the case, the Court of Assises, the Court of Appeals, reversed the decision of the mayor's court in favor of Louis Du Bois. Morris was given continued possession of Anthony and Susanna, and Du Bois was instructed to pay the costs of the suit. And again, you can see that in the bottom right. Although the records located thus far don't tell us exactly what was said in court that day, we know that Anthony and Susanna appeared before the English governor, Edmund Andros. One can't help but wonder if their testimony had an outcome on the case, or had an impact, I should say, on the outcome of the case. Just as the chance to finally lift their own voice in court amid a dispute between two others over their ownership is a powerful example of agency exercised by two people held in bondage, their self-emancipation or their having fled from Du Bois, it forced two European colonizers who were seen in their own time and still are seen as men of kind of particular power and connections those two men of power and connections were forced to expend years worth of effort and legal costs due to a decision Anthony and Susanna made for themselves regarding their own condition. And I think it's maybe even the kind of contradiction, the juxtaposition of that agency, that resistance, and the legal dehumanization, the denial of the humanity of these two individuals, which, I mean, I think lends itself to the importance of this case being that that dehumanization and the resistance in the face of that dehumanization are really two sides of a coin. We have to talk about both sides of that coin anytime we're confronting uh, the topic of enslavement here in New York. 
confronting both how enslaved people were dehumanized and discussing the fact that no dehumanization can ever actually take away someone's humanity. And thankfully for us, we do have one final clue as to the possible fate of Anthony. Unfortunately, we have almost no indication of what happens to Susanna after the final court ruling, after she is ordered to remain on the plantation of the Morris family. But in the document you see here on the left, which is Colonel Lewis Morris's will of 1691, we do have a clue as to what happened to Anthony. Now, this document is long and dense. Uh, I picked out a single page on the left-hand side, the page that reveals a bit about Anthony, uh, and highlighted that portion in the bottom right. In this long and dense document, it really reveals Colonel Lewis Morris's extensive holdings, as well as his wide-ranging connections. Many enslaved individuals, some named and most not, are distributed among various benefactors listed in the will. Midway through the fifth page, which you can see on the left, the document states, in the excerpt which I pulled on the right and highlighted, it states, quote, I give and bequeath unto my Negro man, Tony the Cooper, the sum of 40 shillings a year during his life, besides his usual accommodation, unquote. However, the document specifies that Tony's entitlement was forfeit if he failed to faithfully serve Morris's wife to the end of her life. And while it's impossible to know if Susanna was one of the many other unnamed enslaved individuals listed in the will. It's impossible to know if the Tony, the Cooper listed in this document is actually the Anthony of our case. And it's impossible to know if Morris's final instructions regarding Tony were actually followed. It's a possible clue. And the fact that Tony is referred to here as a Cooper is maybe an indicator that they are the same person, Tony and Anthony being that both Morris and Du Bois made sizable portions of their income on the production and trade of rum and other liquors, occupations for which the skills of a cooper would be incredibly important. And so it's possible that Anthony lived out the rest of his life in, quote, his usual accommodations with a modest income. And it's important to remember this was an outcome first made possible by his and Susanna's 1673 flight from Louis Du Bois. Again, a powerful example of agency and resistance amid enslavement and dehumanization in 17th century New York. Uh, and so I want to thank you all once again uh, for taking the time, uh, you know, out of a, a hot weekday evening um, to join us uh, to gain some insight into this case into the powerful stories of these two enslaved people. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions, but I've also included my email here just in case anyone needs to run and wants to reach back out uh, by email with questions later as well. Thank you so much, Eddie. And I'll make sure to um, to share your email with those who registered as well. So if if those of you who registered, if you, if you aren't able to take down the email right now, you'll you'll definitely get it in a follow-up email that I send, and I'll also send it to you. So, um, uh, Eddie, I'm just going to go ahead and make myself the host. Again, right? Absolutely. Okay, so as as Eddie already mentioned, we'll have uh, time, we have a little time for um, Q&A right now, maybe about 20 minutes. Um, if, if, there, if there are questions or, or comments, some um, things that folks want to know more about, um, you can either um, put it in Q and A, or if you feel so bold and and would like to, um, you know, ask the question live, can can give folks the um, opportunity to to talk and ask the question um, um, with your voice as well. So uh, just uh, give folks a little time to um, ask some questions now, and while hopefully we get some folks asking questions. Um, Eddie, I'll just go ahead and, and uh, ask you for the benefit of the audience. For those who might not be as familiar with um, with the trade of a cooper, why don't you talk a little bit about um, what a cooper would do and uh, um, you know what this Tony mentioned in the final document you showed, um, what what kind of craft that he that he was he was up to? Yeah, so he would have been uh, a cooper producing barrels. Um, and producing barrels both for, you know, liquids like rum, um, but also producing barrels for really all sorts of things. Um, it's really hard 
for us even, I think, today to kind of wrap our minds around how important a barrel maker would be. Um, you know, the barrel is where we're going to prepare something like salt pork, uh, you know, our preserved food for the winter. Uh, a barrel, even with a detachable bottom, might be something that you would use for drying uh, a commodity like flax or wheat. But in the case of both Louis Bois and Louis Morris, uh, both of them, coming from entirely different backgrounds, make a great portion of their money here in the colonies by producing rum. Um, and being someone who makes barrels, I mean, especially for, you know, two colonizers who would have been prominent rum producers, um, it would have been not just an incredibly important trade, but I mean, it's a trade that takes tons of skill, tons of practice, not just to make the barrel themselves, but even just to prepare the materials like the barrel staves, which have to be cut from specific wood, um, for instance. And so being able to put those barrels together, I mean, that's a skill that takes years, a trade, really. And it's also possibly why Louis de Bois, Louis Morris might expend such time and money into gaining ownership of these two individuals back. Um, you know, it's fascinating. Louis de Bois mentions just loss, loss of labor in the harvest. And at first, when I read that, examining my own biases, I'll admit that, you know, I assumed they're out working in a field. But that just as well could have meant something like, you know, a harvest going into making some type of liquor. And it's not just rum. Uh, you know, it could have been going into making any sort of liquor that he was selling. Anything from Applejack to Blackjack to, yeah. So I hope that answered the question to a degree. Oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and it reminds me there's a, a, a story very, very local here to um, to the Bronx for, for those of you in attendance who've, you know, been to Van Cortland. Um, there's there's a lake and and the dam, uh, and the, and the mill um that that made that lake possible was also built by uh enslaved uh craftsmen uh, that you know held by the Van Cortlands. So, so the 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 craftsmanship of of enslaved Africans is is definitely a very interesting aspect of this whole history. And it's yeah. one that um especially like in the 19th century um the the kind of coalescing ideology of white supremacy tried to cover over mm -hmm. um the crap you know the craftsmanship of enslaved africans and claim that europeans found africans you know completely without culture or skill and um you know managed to quote unquote give them these things but but you know you look at earlier documents like this and that's not even a question at play at the moment absolutely um, yeah one of my favorite documents we have here on huguenot street is um it's from the early 19th century, and it is a receipt for the sale of wheat. And it specifies that the wheat grown by um, either the European who's doing the sale or by the other enslaved people on his plantation is a standard price. And the wheat of his enslaved man named James is a significantly higher price than any of the other wheat that he's selling. And in any of the documents, it's always the wheat of James is the most expensive wheat. And I always imagine to myself, you know, what sort of skills, what sort of little tricks maybe that James had developed to make him that that kind of best farmer around. Yeah. Oh, we got a very interesting question here from Diane Roberts. Um, uh, could Anthony and Susanna have lived with the native peoples as free individuals since slavery had not been abolished? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, it was an absolute possibility. Um, we actually have also a document here. Um, well, I don't know that we have it on, on Huguenot Street, but a document related to Huguenot Street that is, is relevant is a 1712 complaint by one of Louis Du Bois's associates. And he's writing to the English governor complaining of the, you know, amount of enslaved men that have fled from New Paltz in just the first 25 years of the community's existence, 30 years, um, complaining of the amount of men from New Paltz that have fled and been welcomed into Lenape-speaking communities. That document specifically refers to Lenape communities in the Delaware Valley. Uh, Anthony and Susanna were probably helped more by Native people on the east side of the Hudson River. But yeah, and that's, I think, one of the, the reasons why, you know, I keep returning to the question of why they chose to return to the plantation of the Morris family. Um, because, I mean, we know from the experiences, the interactions between enslaved people and Native people in other settings across New York, across the Northeast, that oftentimes that's an opportunity for self, for emancipation. That's an opportunity um, for self-emancipation, to be living free, uh, to 
assimilate into a new community where you have more autonomy, where you have a free experience. And yet they choose not to do that. For one reason or another, they choose to return to that, that plantation. And so I think, you know, our most likely hypothesis right now, the one we're kind of playing with the most is that they were returning because they were family members, some sort of community that they were separated from. And I think it's entirely possible that they may have had no intention of staying on that Morris family plantation. They might have been just returning to maybe reconnect with other family members, and then maybe they were hoping to return to that Native community. Um, yeah, we, we don't know, but we haven't ruled that out yet at all. Great question. A great question. Great question. Uh, other questions, um, folks, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and ask you another question uh, while we read other questions. That's all right, Eddie. Um, I, do you plan to... Um, uh, like is is your plan going forward to develop this particular research even more? Are there or are there other um, enslaved individuals uh, that that you want to do more research around? Yeah. So we do hope to um, continue erecting, and I, I should have mentioned this. I should have updated, but uh, we actually are now have those two witness stones, those two memorials for Anthony and Susanna. They've been produced uh, with generous funding from actually a number of Du Bois family descendants. Um, which is incredible. Um, but we do hope to continue researching other enslaved people from New Paltz in the future to continue erecting witness stones at all of our historic houses, hopefully eventually at private homes uh, on sites where the houses no longer stand. But we also hope to continue researching the story of Anthony and Susanna. Um, I mean, even with the holes that we have in, in this story, this is still... It, it's more than I know about almost any enslaved person in New Paltz, except for Sojourner Truth, who, of course, is is exceptional in that we have a narrative, even one ghost written for her. Um, but yeah, it's 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 surprising, shocking, maybe even that we have the extent of records we do have in this case, especially considering how early it is. Um, and it's all thanks to really that that legal dispute. We would know almost nothing of the case if not for that dispute. So although we hope to erect witness stones for other individuals in the future, I think just the the scope of this case, the connections it bears with uh, you know, wider New York history are why we're gonna continue to look into it further in the future as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And and this is obviously um uh speaking more off the cuff here, but I think it'd be amazing if we could get some witness stones for Anthony and Susanna here in the Bronx too. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it'd be it 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 it'd be great if we could find you know uh, any kind of uh, remnants of that history on you know the 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 Morris Estate, um, uh, but unfortunately, there's so so many buildings on so yeah. many parts of it now. Um, yeah, but you know, there's similar things going on with the, on the Van Cortland plantation and and Hunts Point as well, as far as you know, uh, recovering the history of of African burial grounds in both those locations. But I'm sure, um, I'm sure there's one or multiple somewhere on the former Morris estate. Um, but like you said, it was such an extensive property. Um, be hard to know where to where to begin. Yeah, where they would have lived. I wonder about that, right? Like, what what was Anthony's usual accommodation? Where was that located in in what's now the Bronx? It yeah, fascinates me. But that, that's one of the areas we hope to look into a bit a bit further in the future. Absolutely. Okay, we got. Uh, looks like a couple more. Uh, we got another question and a comment. Um, this co uh, the comment first. Um, you know, if if you want to respond to it, you can. Otherwise, I'll just read it out loud. It's again from Diane Roberts. Um, if Anthony and Susanna return because of family ties, it speaks to the strength of the family among the slave community, even though their owners sold their children or other family members. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. that is an incredibly, incredibly important point. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, persisted all throughout the history of enslavement and U.S. Mm -hmm. and this industry. Um, and I really loved your introduction, Stephen. I mean, especially the way you highlighted the fact that, you know, dehumanization, of course, is always a part of it. Mistreatment is always a part of it. And it, and it's, it's something that, you know, not only we have to, but we should, of course, be looking into. 
But, you know, that's always, I think, what's going to, especially, you know, as white individuals, that's what's going to come to our mind first. And, you know, it's this extra step of looking at, well, always you're going to see behind that, this agency, this resistance in the face of it. Um, always remembering that those things are happening in parallel to one another, which I think is so important. Absolutely. And as, as your presentation highlighted, you know, it doesn't always look like the obvious thing. I mean, there there obviously is a tradition and a very rich history behind literal revolts and uprisings of enslaved individuals in New York. But but sometimes it could be, you know, this like really, really uh, amazing move by Anthony and Susanna that caused, you know, years of legal turmoil um, to two enslavers. I mean, you know, like it, it might not look obvious at first, but there's so many instances um, that are exactly. along those lines as well. Um, let's see, here's a question from Stephanie Harris. Unless I missed it, where specifically in Morrisania was the plantation located? That's a fantastic question. Um, so Morrisania today, the neighborhood, really, I would I would rephrase the question, so to speak, because it's not that uh, the plantation was located in a portion of Morrisania. It's that the neighborhood we now call Morrisania made up a small portion, I believe, one of the corners. I want to say the southwest corner, but don't don't quote me on that. Um, of what was the 2000 acre estate of the Morris family. So it was massive. And the family continued to acquire more and more land. It actually doesn't take on the name Morrisania until the nephew, Lewis Morris, the first, well, the second one, but the first of the nephews, um, until he acquires the property from Colonel Lewis, our uncle. So sometime after 1690. Um, so, yeah, it was a massive plantation. I have seen it referenced in secondary histories as that estate being the majority of the Bronx, but I've also seen it consistently referred to as 2,000 acres, which would be nowhere near the majority of the borough of the Bronx. So, Stephen, you might know more on that than me. I'll yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely included, to give folks a little frame of reference, at least folks, you know, living or familiar with the Bronx, I mean, it would have included parts of what we know today as Mott Haven, um, Melrose, Morrisania, parts of like Longwood, Hunts Point area. I mean, you know, really a, a kind of sprawling, um, sprawling area. Definitely not, I mean, you know, there, there were parts of uh, the East, especially like central and Northeast of the Bronx and, and Northwest of the Bronx that their estates didn't touch, but there were other large estates um, that area but but yeah definitely a huge area um uh you know i mean that's a large part of the south bronx maybe that's what people mean. that's a good way to put it yeah maybe that's what they were referring to and yeah. i'll mention um as well i guess just in case anyone's looking to look into this further themselves that usually you won't you'll you'll find mention of it in not just the history of in not just histories of the bronx but oftentimes you'll find mentions of of the morris family in histories of harlem being that that would have been the the common, you know, way to refer to the Bronx originally. The Bronx would have been included in what they would have, at least in the 17th and the early 18th centuries, what they would have called Harlem. That's right. And 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 one one difficulty in recovering a lot of this history is, as your comment just suggests, is you know, sometimes it's hard to track the name of the area of today's Bronx because as as Eddie has mentioned a lot of times in his talk. You know, it wasn't the Bronx until until much, much later. People didn't know it as the Bronx. So, you know, tracking exactly how it's referred to and recovering this history. So I guess, you know, you face that same difficulty in other parts. Like you're just yeah, it's the parallel with the Sopus in Kingston. We only have instances in this case of being referred to as the Asopus, which is maybe not surprising. That was kind of the Dutch name for our region up here. But I mean, one of the areas we don't know is is where much of the case up here is even taking place, which, if anything, I think is kind of funny. We know almost more about where it was taking place in the Bronx. It could have meant Kingston, the city today. It could have meant the village Hurley, where Louis Du Bois was living. Um, it could have meant even like the port down along the Hudson River in the Kingston area. It's just it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Absolutely. Well, let me see. Let me just ask if, if there's any other questions, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, I'll give it another 30 seconds or so to see if there's any other questions. Or like I said, if folks want to um, raise raise their hand, um, can allow people to ask the question live. Let's just give it another seconds. Hey, 
Um, and oh, oh, we, we do have one. Okay, uh, let me see. Walter, I saw you put your hand up and put your hand down. I'm going to go ahead and put you on the spot. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you, it, it'll probably pop up on your computer. Let me see. You should be able to talk. Let me. Okay, how about now? Hello. Oh, yes, that's perfect, okay. Walter. Thank you. Okay. So I'm originally from Hunts Point, and I remember as a young boy, I used to go with my father to the end of Hunts Point, and there was a cemetery there. And uh, some years ago, I, I went back to that cemetery, and I realized that it was uh, a cemetery for slaves. And I can't remember the name of the, uh, the owner. And I'm just wondering, did it reach Hunts Point? Did the... Uh, did the uh, plantation in Marasania reach Hunts Point? And I'm trying, I took pictures actually, I can't find the pictures of, of the cemetery, but I'll be looking and I'll send them to you as soon as I get them. Because I took the picture of the owner of the cemetery and who was buried there. I believe there was, there was slaves buried there. Do you have any wow. information? I don't off the top of my head, Stephen, my, but I'm furiously writing down everything you're saying right now. I'm excited to look further into it. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, there, there's a really tremendous um, undertaking that there's an elementary school right close to the cemetery, um, and they've been, you know, it's been a central part of some of their projects at that elementary school doing research around that cemetery, probably for the last decade or so, maybe even a little longer. Um, but there's a couple teachers there that have kind of spearheaded it, and um, and at the the point in time that the cemetery is from, I think the Morris estate had already been broken up a little bit. Um, but uh, but the names I've seen associated with that cemetery are some of the some of the enslavers in in Hunts Point. At, uh, you know more and more in the late seventeen early eighteen hundreds. Um, the the Hunts, the Drakes, um, etc. And there's even a couple of um, uh, Walt, you mentioned um, you took some photographs of it. There's a couple photographs from the like uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. They're they're so old that they're on their glass negatives, uh, an old photographic medium um, of a couple of of grave markers from the enslaved um, African burial ground. There, um, we have a couple of those photographs in our collections. Um, but uh, but it's definitely a history that. A few people are, are working on um, recovering. There's even a, a performance piece um, from a, a Bronx um, artist and, and dancer choreographer, Alethea Pace. Um, I think she's performing. She's already performed uh, the piece once or twice, but I think in September there'll be another performance. I'll send, I'll, I'll send information to folks once they Well, I'm willing to go back and visit and take some more pictures and send to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, in, incredibly important history. And, you know, I mean, um, the fact that there's even photographs of that, you know, of that burial ground while there were still grave markers there even um, is, is a really incredible thing. Um, yeah. And we're yeah. looking into, even if it, it doesn't necessarily bear connections to Anthony and Susanna and the Morris family, we are looking into the history of uh, enslaved burial grounds here in New Paltz. And we have similar issues. We don't necessarily have surviving markers or images of what they would have looked like. So, I mean, any other burial ground that we can kind of also use as a case study to maybe gain some more information on ours or gain tips on what to look for with our burial ground is super useful. So I'm going to look further into that. And that's that's a, a huge help, Walter. Thank you so much for suggesting that. Okay. All right, Walter, I'm going to go ahead and let me see here. Hey, okay. yeah, thank you, Walter. Okay. Um, well, uh, it's, it's, a it's a hot summer night. So, and it's still light outside. So, uh, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, and end, um, but, but let's give it up for Eddie for a very, um, interesting and informative, very well-researched talk and looking forward, um, to, uh, seeing more research, uh, coming out from historic Huguenot Street and looking forward to, uh, a, a budding relationship with absolutely and we'll be yeah. sharing sharing updates with you folks uh as we find anything new in the future of course so stay absolutely. tuned
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thanks. And like I said, I'll send a follow up email with some more information and information about historic Huguenot Street and uh, this recording itself. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you.